the Alaskan UFO and the Alaskan UFO. And so the interesting thing is, we oftentimes in audiences, especially for example the National Space Society, when I give a similar lecture, I tone it down as far as the mention of UFO, of course, but I at least include this slide and some of the others, because here's research that is now to me very scientifically valid in associating subsonic flight and superluminal flight. And we find the form of the equations are identical, and also the behavior of the curves are exponential as you approach the barrier, the velocity barrier. And of course, the bottom graphs show the same thing, that as we look at the speed of sound and the speed of light, you tend to get a compression effect in the medium. And of course, in, in air, you're getting the compression of air, but what kind of medium is being compressed as you're flying through space? Well, it's the quantum vacuum. Quantum vacuum literally exhibits a compression as well, and it's called einstein hopf drag. So there's interesting um, viscous drag being compared to the Lorentz force that's exerted by the observer. And this is a close-up of the two graphs showing the flight resistance increase with speed. And so David Froning, who shared these graphs with me, <clears throat> and I saw them, him in Utah at a local chapter meeting of the National Space Society, is pursuing us very seriously in uh, terms of uh, the uh, simulations, the mathematical analysis, and he hopes to actually see a working model of this uh, soon. And so the interesting thing is that the superluminal saucer, as we call it, is being evolved and designed as a saucer design. He's, he's, he's forced to include, and this I find very exciting, from basic principles, he comes up with a saucer design because he wants to include a toroid. And a toroid is circular. So all of a sudden we have a discovery that saucers now have scientific reasoning. There's something inside them that obeys our physics laws, and it's understandable. And the toroid is exactly how he's perturbing the quantum vacuum magnetic field. The two are connected. And you can see the uh, field lines that he's creating with the toroid at the bottom. You can visit quantumfields.com if you want to learn more about his work. I find it very uh, promising and very encouraging. And what I should include also, and it's here in the center, is that the zero point field, the quantum vacuum field, loses its drag when the temperature approaches zero degrees absolute. Anybody know the temperature of outer space? It's about three degrees absolute. It's like the closest you can get to zero and the closest you can get to losing drag. This is an optimum place to travel if you know what fuel to use. <laughs> and now here's a simulation, just a couple of slides to show you the comparison of space-time warping and vacuum polarization. And we're moving to your left. <coughs> this is at 0.99, the speed of light. And this is comparing the thermal radiation pressures of the air on the left and the vacuum pressures of the zero-point radiation uh, on the right. And we're still at 0.99 of that barrier speed, which of course is different than the first light. And the interesting thing is that with, um, with air pressures, there's a positive thermal radiation pressure that, that tends to resist. In other words, at the bottom, you see retardation moving to the right, motion is to the left. Now, this tends to be an uh, accepted and taken for granted phenomenon. Of course, Chuck Yeager was pretty afraid when he broke the sound barrier. He didn't know if the pressures would get too great, of course. You know? But now what's in interesting is, the negative zero point vacuum radiation, and these are slides still from David Cronin, exert on a high speed vehicle, guess what? It's in the same direction of motion. <clears throat> so you've got an impulsion effect that actually aids in the movement of the saucer that's designed properly to interact with the vacuum. And this is just a couple of, about a 20 slide um, uh, chain of uh, simulations that go to several times the speed of light. At speed light, we still have a very high pressure at the very point of that saucer. And then at two times the speed of light, we see a trail, much like you do the sonic boom trail behind the uh, airplane that's breaking the sound barrier, <coughs> shock wave, in other words. Three times, it's becoming more compressed. And there's several more that come from that as well. 
So as we move on to various other types of um, anecdotal reports, um, I do have to give credit to Stephen Greer and the Exposure Project for including in, in his book the, this particular diagram of a cross-section of a small saucer that was uh, around the 1952 site in Belgium, Congo. <coughs> and what's interesting is it seems to be a uh, domestically created one because it had radar included and uh, various other things that involved some circular motion as well, rotating rim. And if anyone you know about the Andreasian affair, uh, the first book is actually a better one for these diagrams I'm about to show you. The, the second book gets more into uh, the continuing saga. But the uh, friend of mine, Paul Potter, was kind enough to share these slides of his, um, I would say, artistic rendition of the Andreasian uh, ship, as, as reported in the book. <coughs> first of all, he describes the crystal spheres at the bottom as being charged up. And without going into a lot of the detail, although you should be at least impressed with the scientific detail that he's referencing in explaining how the ship is powered. Uh, notice in the upper right hand corner, Journal of Applied Physics is uh, cited to give reference to dielectric reasons and how the high intensity field can actually cause um, the suspense, uh, the causing suspensoids but it's a liquid medium that's surrounding these spheres uh, to be able to build up charge. And here's an overview of how these four spheres interact with the toroidal uh, arrangement of the polarized charges and the, what he calls an electrofluid. And of course, this is advanced physics. Nobody knows about this stuff on Earth, but you got to give somebody like Paul Potter a lot of credit because he's approaching the unusual with an open mind, applying all the laws of physics that we know today. And it makes sense. That's the interesting thing. The, the ship design has some rationale to it that can be scientifically explained. And of course, he has a whole bunch of slides like this showing the, the flow of charge, the, uh, the increase in forces that are involved. And of course, even the ionizing flow of air is contributing to the uh, power that he's able to describe the uh, ship being developed. And this is one of the last slides that he describes the electron flow, the fluid flow, and the toroidal magnetic flux that's involved at the atomic level for creating interatomic pulsing forces. And so at least he's made an attempt that I believe is, is scientifically valid to help